it's hot today. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I, uh, I got nothing. It's just so freaking humid today. I can't get through a video. Um, y you know, like, okay, how about Kaido, who's a dragon, uh, versus uh, Kizaru? There you go. Kaido versus Kizaru. You, you, you don't need me for this. All right, go in the comments and, and take it away. I'm, I'm just gonna chill out here and uh, not move. Oh yeah, wait, wait, wasn't there a um? Now that I think about it, wasn't there like an island that the Straw Hats went to a while back that was pretty hot? You know, it was like uh, they had this big epic battle there, and Luffy punched an alligator through a roof. Like, wasn't that a? Uh... Oh, oh wait, yeah, no, wait, yeah, it was. Uh, I don't remember the name of the island, but I do know it was related to geography. All right, all right, you know what? I'll do it. I'll do it for the sake of geography. Geography is everything! Yeah, we got another intro for this. That brings our grand total up to three. Personally, in my opinion, you can never have too many Geography is Everything intros, but I am a little biased for that opinion. But thank you to David for making me that new intro. Okay, so this is something I've wanted to do for a while. It was like when I started this series, which over a year ago now, we've had over a year of Geography is Everything. Do you understand yet? Do you understand the madness I have to cope with on a daily basis? I go to bed every night reciting off every country in the freaking European Union and it's getting really confusing with recent events. I'll tell you something, right? That is how much geography is everything to me. But no, when I first started the series, I'm like, okay, so Water 7, Annie's Lobby, all of the main islands the Straw Hats have visited. Thriller Bark is going to be coming up in Halloween because we're, we're getting close to October, so I'm just going to wait for that. But the one of the big ones was, of course, course, the Alabasta Kingdom. Fun fact, the Alabasta Kingdom, the island that it's on, I think right now it's just called Alabasta, but before the Alabasta Kingdom was founded, it was actually called Sandy Island. That was just the name of the place, because I guess the original cartographers and explorers, you know, back in the day in the One Piece world were not very creative. They're just like sailing around and they land on an island and they're like, well, sir, we got a lot of sand here. I'll be like, well... Sandy Island, let's get going. And it's like, God help them if they actually ended up on another island that was full of sand. They'd be like, well, what now, sir? I'm like, well, uh, we could go Sandy Island 2, The Revenge. And they just keep going on that, like, like lame movie titles. But yeah, you know, actually, fun fact about Alabasta. I know it had, like, a civil war. Well... No, no, yeah, it was basically a civil war. Yeah, it was kind of like that. Now, not exactly because it was like Crocodile orchestrating everything, manufacturing a civil war, but it was basically a civil war. Um, you know, ever since then, though, Alabasta's crime rate has actually dropped to negative five. And the reason for that is because every single citizen has a copious amount of pocket sand at their disposal at any given time. So anybody walks up to them, they're going to get pocket sand right in the face. So nobody even tries to steal anything anymore, okay? That's 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 the solution that Alabasta found. Okay. So anyway, yeah. Alabasta Kingdom. Uh, it is the first island the Straw Hats visit that really gets a full map in like a large scope. This makes sense given the fact that the Alabasta Saga was a freaking saga. The East Blue it was just like, alright, let's go to this island and have a little adventure there. Let's go to this island. But after they got into the Grand Line, they were setting up Alabasta as the final destination destination in like the first leg of their Grand Line journey. It's like, okay, we have Laboon, then Whiskey Peak, then Little Garden, then Drum Island, and then finally it crescendos. That's a really fun word you don't get to use very often. Crescendos at the end with Alabasta, which brings um, to full circle Vivi's little story arc and everything about the Baroque works that we've learned about through Little Garden, Whiskey Peak, and we find out about Crocodile and everything. So it makes sense that when we get there, Oda isn't just going to have it like, you know, the Straw Hats land at Alabasta, and the castle is right there, and they run in, and they fight, and they win, and everybody's happy. 
arc over. No, there's a little bit of a journey they have to make here. They have to make a little bit of a, a, a trek through the desert, so to speak, in order to even get to their um, destination, right? So, this is a map of Alabasta Kingdom. It's not the entire island. You can see there's sections of it that are kind of cut off on the edges of the map, but for all intents and purposes, this is the main focus of Alabasta. So obviously there's more to the island than just this, but most of the island, you gotta remember, is just an expansive desert. Now, there, the desert's not completely empty because Alabasta Kingdom's been around for a while. The Palace of Alubarna itself was built around 4,000 years ago. I'm gonna repeat that again because 4,000 years is pretty pretty long ago. We're used to just being like the void century as the end-all be-all when we're talking about the mysterious past of the One Piece world. It all is it's focused on the void century. But no, there's plenty of stuff that happened well before then, and the construction of the Alabasta Kingdom was one of them. So there's um, actually some interesting history we're going to get into later revolving around how Alabasta Kingdom was built and everything. We don't know a lot of stuff, but we know a little bit. And so I imagine all around the desert, you could probably find ruins of old cities, maybe even like, uh, you know, some like shrines or something all over the place, just scattered around the island that have been there for like, oh, this was a, a hub of commerce 2,000 years ago, but then it died out because of sandstorms and it's just a ruin now. But there are stuff out there. Uh, Cobra, I think, even trusted Toto and his son Koza to go to Yuba and kind of set that place up as a new city. So I'm sure like that's one of the things that the people of Alabasta are always trying to do is like find new oasis in the desert where they can set up, you know, new uh, little hubs there so people can stop and travel to continue their journey. Alabasta itself, the island, is is really big, okay? But this is all we're really dealing with right now in the Alabasta Ark, okay? So the first place the Straw Hats land, the main port city of Alabasta, is Nanohana. Now, Nanohana is not so severe when it comes to the heat as with the rest of the island. It's still pretty bad there if you're not used to the heat and everything when you get there, it's you're gonna be baked. But but it's next to the water, and this is where everybody lands, so there's a lot of, like, uh, there's a lot of traders there selling their wares and all that stuff, and you're not really getting into the heat of the desert itself yet, so you should be okay if you just land in Nanohana. In fact, I imagine most of the people that visit Alabasta just kind of stop at Nanohana, they get off, try to sell their wares, like, get your authentic wine here, you know, whatever, and then they sell their stuff, and they get back on their ships, and they leave. You know, it's a port city. Most people are probably not going to trek into the desert unless it's a really good reason for them to do so, like the Straw Hats, okay? So, little side note about um, Nanohana, there is another town very close to it, within, like, honestly, less than an hour or so's travel by cart, all right? Because remember, when Chopper arrived on the island, he was having, you know, symptoms of, like, heat stroke, <laughs> because I felt bad for Chopper there. It's just like, all right, Chopper, your reindeer, covered in thick fur, completely designed for a winter climate, let's take you to a desert island next. That'll go over great. I'm glad Oda actually addressed that. Just like, oh yeah, no. He is completely out of his element. With only in like in a few minutes of being on the island, even with his fancy new desert clothes, it doesn't matter. He's covered in fur. You know, he's like, you know, I'm like, uh. and so he climbs into the back of a cart, and the cart uh, eyelashes is pulling at the camel, and uh, they manage to get all the way to another town really close to Nanohana called Kataria. And Chopper doesn't stay there for very long, with eyelashes assistance, he manages to get back to Nanohana. So those two islands are, I mean, those two towns are probably very, very close to each other. We don't really find out much about Kataria, but it's where Koza set up his his forces. So it was probably a place that, you know, was safe from most of Baroque works, although there was Baroque works infiltration on both sides. But he set it up there for a reason. Koza's not an idiot. There was probably some strategic reason for setting up the base there. Or rather, Koza might have just, because the base was originally in Yuba as well. So Koza might have been like, every few months, every few years maybe, you know, make sure to move the base around so they don't know where we're at and then they attack us on Moss. You know, that's probably the smart move, right? So those are the two towns there. So after stocking up for the trip into the desert at Nanohana, getting their desert gear, getting Nami's, you know, uh, dancer girl outfit and Vivi all ready to go on that front and also 
some actual proper desert gear. As you would probably imagine, Oda bases a lot of the islands off of real world locations, hence another reason why geography is everything. In the case with Alabasta, it's mostly Egypt. Uh, there's even like the buildings that we see kind of are similar to Cairo, but of course every like Middle Eastern country could be referenced in some way when we're in Alabasta. But there's like, they, they take a lot from Egyptian mythology because you have Pell, who is a falcon and indicative of Horus, and the falcon is the guardian deity of Alabasta itself, and Horus was essentially like the main guardian deity, one of the big, the head honchos of Egyptian mythology. That was Horus. All right, so obviously Oda was taking a lot of references to that, but references to other countries around the Middle East as well, right? So then you have the Sandora River. Okay, and that's right in the middle of the island. So this is a way where actually a lot of ships can get inland to places to deliver to various towns like maybe Rain Base, or maybe this is even how they get ships to Alubarna. Alubarna, the capital, is not located on the shore, which makes getting to it fairly difficult. Now, remember, when the Straw Hats visit Alabasta, and in the few years leading up to it, they had an unprecedented drought because of all the crap Crocodile was pulling. It is a Desert Kingdom. It's usually pretty damn dry, but the weather is not that bad. Like, the drought that they were dealing with was, like, you know, basically disaster-level proportions by the time the Straw Hats got there, okay? But even so, Alubarna, huge city, smack dab in the middle of the desert. I'm sure there's various trade routes to get there and stuff, and there might have even been some towns along the way to stop. It's just those towns were wiped out by Crocodile, maybe trying to isolate the capital as much as possible as much as possible, so it would finally make it easier for him to do what he needs to do. Now, when it comes to the royal palace, okay, uh, we see a little bit of it, like, when the Straw Hats are, you know, in there, like, chilling out and everything, but the main attraction here during the end of the arc was the tomb, you know, the, the tomb of the kings, you know, so basically kind of the same deal how the ancient Egyptians were to, you know, entomb their dead, and maybe there's mummies in the tomb, that would be pretty cool, too. We didn't really get to see a lot of mummies, but I'm sure there are. Um, you know, this is where the great treasure of Alabasta is kept, the Poneglyph. Now keep in mind, remember, the palace at Alub Alubarna existed 4,000 years ago. This was long, long before the Void Century and the Poneglyphs were created. All right, so I just wanted to bring that up and keep that in mind, that it wasn't like this place was built to house this thing. There's, you know, thousands of years of rich history in this um, tomb that has nothing to do with the Poneglyphs. But the Poneglyphs were entrusted to the Nefeltari family from, I guess, the Kozuki clan, which would make sense because the Nefeltari family family is the only family out of the original 20 to not choose to uh, accept Celestial Dragon status, to go to Marijua. They decided to live in their own island. So maybe the Kozuki clan back in the day, the people that originally crafted the Poneglyphs, saw that they were good people. They're not like the other Celestial Dragons. We can trust them, and, and they still have a kingdom that they rule over and everything, so we can trust a Poneglyph to them. And they gave it to Cobra and Vivi's ancestors, and that probably is the reason why, you know, that they ended up getting one, you know? Like they were they were, you know, tasked to guard it, and of course, Cobra was like, you know, I'm not gonna let you see it, you know, it really took him a while for Cobra to be like, okay, fine, I'll show you, you've threatened my daughter and everything, I'll show you where it is, right, and then, of course, even then, Robin lied to Crocodile about, like, what was written on it, so, Crocodile, buddy, I'm sorry, but you just, you, you can't always get what you want, but there he goes, okay, so that, that's Alubarna, though, it's the site of the major final battle there, it also has a clock tower, which is where um, you know Crocodile kept the uh, the uh, One Piece nuke in that you know in that little enclosed space that he launched that Pell was able to serve. Not a very good explosive device if a bird was able to survive it, but you know it it created a fairly large explosion. It's just that Crocodile wasn't aware that Pell was made out of. Um, well, actually, Pell, fun fact, is actually made out of a material. It, you know that Kachin stuff in Dragon Ball, like the hardest material in the universe. Yeah. Pell is made out of Neo Super Uber Kachin, you know, so you do not mess with that bird, okay, so he survived it. So that's Alubarna. We also have, on the opposite side of the Sandora River, so if the Sandora River kind of cuts right in the middle of the island, uh, you have Alubarna on this side, then the river, and then you have Rain Base, located on pretty much the exact opposite side of it, okay? Rain Base is the place where it rains a lot. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't affected by the drought really at all. And not surprisingly, it's the place Crocodile lives in a awesome crocodile themed casino, uh, which also has uh, houses his banana wani and everything there. Uh, so he's like I said, he's a freaking Bond villain. He, he lives in a casino. He wears the furs. He's twirling wine. Crocodile would be right at home in a Bond movie. OK, great. So he's there, and this is the place where the Straw Hats end up to kind of just face off against him, because I believe the general idea was like, hey, Crocodile's there. We, we know where his, uh, his place of residence is. Why don't we just go knock on his door, fight him, beat him, and then we're good, you know, and, and then we're good, you know. We still have some problems to deal with, but I mean, like, he, we know where he is. Let's just go. So they end up in Rain Base, and um, it, it doesn't really work too well. Crocodile ends up capturing them, and Smoker, fairly easily on his part. And so he has a moment where he's just talking about his master plan and all that jazz, and then he leaves them to their fate of being eaten by a banana wani. But, of course, Sanji shows up, Mr. Prince, and takes care of business there. Rain Base, though, was a really cool-looking town, though. I really like the design of, once again, an Egyptian reference the pyramid which was the casino and of course the giant crocodile on the top of it you know the the the, the apex of the pyramid that was pretty cool uh, a neat design anyway uh, ever since the um, yeah, after the whole uh, fight was over and crocodile was defeated uh, the casino was shut down so I, I really hope they don't demolish the building I hope they turn it into something else like I don't know uh, 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 just a restaurant or hey you can reopen the casino you know gambling's good for commerce you know you got to build up money somehow um, you know you just got to put somebody else in charge of it and you'll be put Karu in, in charge of the casino I think I think just nothing else just to see a giant duck wearing a tuxedo and a pair of sunglasses you know like people are in there they're playing the slots they're playing craps or whatever and it's like oh this person's caught cheating and then Karu walks out and he's just like and I was like, no, no, you don't understand, man. You don't understand. I wasn't counting cards. Like, and then Karu jumps up and starts smacking him with his wings or starts biting him. And Karu, you, you could be the new, you could be the new manager of rain dinners. Got a free, I got, I want to see that drawn now. I want to see Karu wearing a tuxedo in the casino with all the other members of the supersonic duck squad. Like they're the, they're the, they're like the mafia when it comes to the casino. You don't mess with them. All right. All right. So that, that, that's rain base. Now, those are essentially the main. Um, you know, built up cities in Alabasta. Nanohana, Alubarna, Rain Base. Those are the ones where a lot of the population lives. There's a decent enough amount of rain to, you know, have, you know, grow crops at least in order to live. In the case with Nanohana, it's more of just because it's the port town, so new food and everything is coming in that way. So you don't have to worry too much about growing your own food there. But Rain Base and Alabarna are the only places that really get a significant amount of rain in that regard. Now, all the other towns in Alabasta, they're they're there, but they're kind of, you know, worse off considering, you know, the, the drought and everything. We have Aramalu which is a complete ghost town. They went there, and I believe uh, VV referred to Aramalu as the Green City, or something like that, the City of Greens. And it's a lo it's a located really close to the Sandora River. So if you get on a ship and just sail from Nanohana over to Aramalu, maybe Aramalu also was one of the port cities at one point, but maybe Crocodile was like, eh, having too many ports into this island might not be a good idea. Let's, let's only have one, and then I can control that one, and then we'll be good. Then we have Yuba, which is located a little bit north of that, which was also a thriving city at one point, at least in terms of when you know, Vivi remembers it. Toto and Koza were building it up, and of course that's where Koza set up the original base of the uh, the rebellion. But unfortunately, by the time the Straw Hats got there, it was also pretty much wiped out uh, by uh, by Crocodile. Toto was still there digging up as much water as he could, though, and that of course gives Luffy the water, which in turn gives him the hint on how to defeat Crocodile. So that was of course relevant there. We have a place called uh, Tamarisk. We never see it. But it's an um, it's the town where Hina docked when she arrived at Alabasta. Okay, because Hina arrives near the end of the arc to try to capture Luffy and everybody and figure out what's going on here. Meet up with Smoker, and she lands at a town called Tamarisk. Uh, maybe it's a town you know bordering the Sandora River. Maybe it's a little bit more inland. Uh, maybe it's around some other side of the island. But that's where she docked her ship at. Okay. And then we have one town that's only seen in the anime. Remember, there was a lot of filler episodes when it came to Alabasta. Uh, when the Straw Hats got into the desert, uh, that's, I think, when the anime was like, okay, we could stretch this out a little bit. And they did it in a good way. They had an episode that focused on Ace. Ace got to travel with him a little bit longer. He fought a giant scorpion at one point. That was fun. There was a guy pretending to know stuff about Blackbeard. That's why Ace went with them and met up with him, and then he decided to leave. So it's a little bit more with Ace's character arc. And then 
while we're traveling through the desert, we find out a little bit more about, like, the fallout of everything happening with the rebellion and the civil war and what Crocodile has wrought and everything. And I believe there, the town um, Edo uh, was a place where there was a guy living there, and he was, like, pretending to be part of the rebellion, and the Straw Hats meet that guy. And so that gives, like, a whole new, kind of whole new perspective on the whole thing. It's not as simple as just, like, there's the rebellion, there's the royal army, and then here are the Straw Hats. There's, there's like, you know, learning a little bit more about the... How, how the citizens of Alabasta are coping with this. Some are forming their own ragtag groups. Some wish to join the rebellion, but they're a little bit too, they, they don't, they don't want to die, so they're just like, well, we're going to pretend to be part of the rebellion or fight in our own ways, or we're just going to try to, like, lay low and hope that, you know, the town doesn't get afflicted by anything like that. So we find out a little bit more in those filler arcs, but yeah, Edo was a town there. And I believe those are only the places that we know about um, in, in Alabasta. Here is... Does anybody like um, the Evil Dead series, uh, the original Evil Dead movies with uh, Bruce Campbell, who plays Ash Williams? Okay. Um, you might be thinking, like, wh okay, wh Matt, are you going off on a tangent again? Like, we can talk about the horror movies, but we're doing this right now. Like, no, 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 no. No, this connects back in such a weird way, all right? So, there is a grocery store in Alabasta, a, a branch of grocery store, which makes sense you still gotta buy groceries somewhere i think it's in nanohana um makes sense the name of the grocery store though we see a bag we see a character carrying a bag with like the logo of the grocery store on it and it's s smart that's right shop smart shop s smart you got that okay i just i wanted to make that reference all right, if you have no idea what that was, go watch Army of Darkness, for the love of God. But now I cannot help but imagine Ash Williams in Alabasta going up against Crocodile. You know, like, it wouldn't last very long, but I think it would last long enough for Ash to get one really good quip in before Crocodile completely destroys him. Like, Ash walks up to Crocodile, loads his shotgun, just like, hey, lizard humper. How about I shove some sand where the sun don't shine? <laughs> and Crocodile just... Pff. Hmm. <laughs> and then just he gets destroyed. But I just... I read that. I found that out today. And, like, there's a place called S-Smart in One Piece. And I'm like, okay. This is already one of my favorite manga. But, you know, it just, it just keeps on connecting back, you know? So, I mentioned earlier about some history in Alabasta that I, I think you should know. All right, so remember when Nico Robin was beneath the tomb with Crocodile, and Crocodile was like, okay, read the Poneglyph. What does it say? Nico Robin knew that the location of Pluton was on that Poneglyph, but she didn't say it. She instead just recited uh, history revolving around Alabasta, various conquests and different eras of, of the country and everything. And Crocodile was was pissed. He was like, whoa, whoa, I'm not, I don't care about any of that crap. Let me know where Pluton is. And Nico Robin lies and says, oh, no, it's, it's not on here. And then, of course, that leads to <laughs> their falling out. Now... I do believe that the information that Robin gave to Crocodile wasn't just stuff she was pulling out of nowhere. Robin is a scholar. Okay, so I like to think that she, you know, knew a lot about Alabasta previously, or maybe she found another historical poneglyph. I know a million people are going to be asking because I get asked it all the time. Every time I bring up Alabasta, it's like, what about the other poneglyph that was under the desert? I'm like, that was an anime only thing. Forget about it. It's not going to be relevant. It's not a Rio Poneglyph. Don't worry about it. If anything, it's just a Poneglyph that is similar in script, and it just has history about the country. That's all it is. Don't worry about it. The Straw Hats are not going to have to travel all the way back to Alabasta to find out about it. It's not relevant. It was anime only, okay? But... You know, Robin probably learned about the history of the country from books or from other writings or other ruins, and I don't like to think that she was just making that up. And the important stuff about the things she said were not exactly the stuff that she explained, like the history. And I'm going to pull this up here because this stuff is really like, like, allow me to, allow me to elaborate here. Um, in the Age of Heaven, the Tenreiki, 239, this is the year, 239 Age of Heaven. That's already weird enough because... We don't usually get, like, direct dates in One Piece. Oda doesn't usually say, like, the payback war between the Whitebeard crew and Blackbeard occurred in 1761. You know, we, we don't get that usually, okay? So this is a direct date. In the year 239 in the Age of Heaven, Kahira conquers Alabasta. 
In the year 260, Age of Heaven, the Betian dynasty of Tamar begins its rule. In 306, Age of Heaven, Great Toph Temple is completed in Aramalu. In 325, the hero of Ultia, Mamudin, and then this is where it, it got cut off because this was the point when Crocodile was like, Stop! I don't care about any of that crap! All right. So, what's important here is not necessarily the information in there. Like, I don't care about the temple being built in Aramalu. I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was glorious. I'm sure it was like the great library of Alexandria in its day. I'm sure it was amazing. But I'm, that's not what I'm really concerned about right now. I'm concerned about these dates. Okay, because now you're giving us ages of heaven. Like, different eras or ages in One Piece, okay? And the ages seem to count up. It doesn't seem to be the same deal like BC and AD in our world. Like, in the, like, let's say... This person was born in the year 500 BC, and they died in the year 400 BC. They lived 100 years, but it counts down, all right? It keeps counting down, then you get to year zero, and then it starts counting up again. That doesn't seem to be the way it works in the One Piece world anyway. If we're going to break these up into ages, then it might go like Age of Heaven, zero, and then do, 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 keeps going up, keeps going up, and then when that Age of Heaven ends whenever that happens. I'm not sure when they would come up with a, a, okay, guys, the Age of Heaven is definitely over. Let's reset the calendar, but I guess that's what they would have to do. So they go up like Age of Heaven up to year 500, and then the Age of Heaven, Heaven ends, and now it's the Age of Romance, and then that lasts from 0 to 650, and then that ends, and now it's the, uh, the Age of Coconuts! The Age of Coconuts has begun, ladies and gentlemen! And that begins from, you know, 0 up until... Well, basically where we're at right now, honestly. So yeah, we are in the age of coconuts in, in the One Piece world. And yes, that was a that was a long way to get to a boob joke. But uh, I got to keep trying to be innovative. You know what I mean? All right. So all of that history, though, that Robin explained was about how Alabasta's, you know, you know, how the country lived, you know, way, way back when. If the Alubarna Palace was built 4,000 years ago, it would stand to reason that all of this history happened after that, okay? Now, we don't know a date from when the palace was created. We just know that 4,000 years ago, a palace was created. So, 4,000 years ago, around that general time frame, might have been this Age of Heaven. And there probably were a lot of other ages before and after it. Maybe not. Maybe Age of Heaven referred to, like, the furthest back you could possibly get. Like, history is really sparse from that era. It would be like prehistory where we're at right now. It's just like, can we find things that exist in prehistory? You know, like, can we find, like, cave drawings and stuff that were, like, 50,000 years old? Like, yeah, we can find stuff like that. Um, but it was in a time before written language and anything we might find from that era is going to be very, you know, worn by time and we have to be very careful with it. So it might be something like that, Age of Heaven. I, it sounds like, you know, like if you're going to have a, an age named after like the first piece of recorded history on your planet, Age of Heaven sounds like a good place to do it, you know, um, you know, or you could just have the Age of the, the Beginnings or something like that. But I, I just wanted to bring it up because... I don't know if Oda's ever going to go reference it again, like, way far back, like, the origin of, you know, how the One Piece world was created or anything. I, I don't know if we're going to go into that much detail here. He might just go back and explain the Void Century and anything, maybe a few, because there are stuff that happens before the Void Century, like, uh, Zunisha. Zunisha, you know, started its trek, or at least Zunisha is a thousand years old. All right, so we might go a little further back than the Void Century, but I don't see us going all the way back, like, you know, 5,000 years ago. Maybe we will, because that was around the time the Tree of Knowledge was planted. The Tree of Knowledge was planted, I believe, 5,000 years ago, and that is the earliest point in One Piece we've heard about. That's the furthest back that anybody has mentioned. The Alabarna Palace being built, that is the second, you know, furthest back. All right, so we maybe we will at some point. I hope we do, cause I I would I would like an entire like little like maybe like four or five chapters dedicated to that. But that's just me, you know, going about. Oh yes, please explain to me all the ancient history of the One Piece world. I need to know this, cause maybe things back then could set up to where we're at right now. Who who knows? Maybe uh, d uh, there was a meteor that hit the Earth, and then it turned into a giant tree, and then devil fruits sprang from that tree, and then people took the devil fruits and planted them all over the world, and that's how we got devil fruits. 
Maybe. I don't know. But it would be cool to find out, wouldn't it? All right. So anyway, yeah, that's uh, that's Alabasta, though. Really interesting country. A lot of, of cool lore dwelling in the crypts of that place. So, um, yeah, probably never going to go back to it again. But Vivi is always around, and you know, we could always, you know, cut back to her. Maybe she's like me. Maybe if they get back from Reverie. Oh, I just thought of a good idea. How about this? How about Cobra doesn't make it out of Reverie? How about, how about that? How about they just, okay, we need to, he's asking too many questions. They get rid of him. And then, of course, Vivi is all distraught and everything. And maybe maybe the government, maybe the Gorosei or somebody even threatened Vivi. And they go up to her and they're just like, okay, listen. Your dad was asking too many questions. You, current queen of Alabasta. Congratulations, by the way. Uh, here's your coronation. Here's your tiara. Vivi is like crying her eyes out. Or my dad said this. Pop a tiara on her head. Like, here you go. You're the queen now. Okay. You follow us. You follow orders. All right? Because we can do this. We can do this as much as we want. We're the world government. Vivi and Igaram and Pell and everybody, they return to Alabasta. They get back to the island, and maybe Cobra, because Cobra's not an idiot. Cobra maybe knew something like that might happen. So maybe Cobra left, like, a letter for Vivi. Like, Vivi, if I do not return from Reverie, I know what happened, and you need to go down into the crypts. Like, he, he gives her, like a, like, a note or something. He's like, you need to go down in the crypts in this specific hidden location, and you will find the history of not only our country, but also of the Void Century. It's all recorded down there, and, and you can you can find it down there. That's something I want you to see. And then maybe maybe we have, a, like, a chapter where we have Vivi reading something and learning about, like, something relating to Alabasta, but also the Poneglyphs or the Void Century or the history of the world. Something like that. If there's any place it could be outside of, like, O'Hara, which was burned to the ground, and outside of Marijua, like in that in that vault... Alabasta is a pretty old land. It might have it too. You know, the most ancient places in the world hide the most secrets. You know what I mean? All right. So yeah, that's Alabasta though. Thanks for watching everybody. Uh, keep the mystery alive. This will be Techie 101 signing out. It is still very hot in this room. Ah.